Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Anna Bross, Senior Vice President of Communications at The Atlantic, and we've been doing a full day on the future of democracy. We are here this afternoon to talk about the future of the civil rights movement, and this is going to be a very powerful conversation led by our senior editor, Van R. Newkirk II. He is a senior editor, as I mentioned, at The Atlantic and host of a new narrative podcast that we have coming out in two days called Holy Week. Holy Week, um, and today's the first time that audiences here are going to get to listen to a little bit of the podcast, and we have posters for you to take as well. Holy Week tells the story of the immediate aftermath of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination nearly 55 years ago, April 4th, 1968, a moment that is often viewed as a conclusion to a powerful era of civil rights in America. The podcast tells the story of how these seven days diverted the course of that social revolution and set the stage for modern clashes over voting rights, police brutality, redlining, critical race theory, and racism. All episodes of the podcast are available, as I mentioned, this Tuesday, March 14th. Here to discuss history's impact on the future of the civil rights movement, please welcome Hassan Jeffries, Associate Professor at The Ohio State University, and Janae Nelson, the President and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and my colleague, Van Newkirk. Thank you all for coming and joining us on this very important day, Selection Sunday. Also, the clocks went forward, so uh, thank you all for braving all the sleep deprivation as well, especially those with kids. Well, thank you, Hassan and Janae, for joining us today um, and for talking about the future of civil rights. Uh, I have my first question is for both of you, and it's the most important one of the day. You ready for it? Okay, okay. Go. Do you all think there is a shot for the Carolina Tar Heels to make the tournament <laughs> this year? Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. The real question, uh, I want to set the table for this discussion, and I'm hoping that you both can tell us generally your view on the current state of democracy. We're looking at the future of democracy in this event, and uh, just sort of, uh, what you see from your purchase looking out at the world. I'm happy to start. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here and wonderful to be with you, Van. Congrats on your new podcast. Thank you. Very excited for it. OK, so the state of our democracy, um, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone to say that it is in peril. Um, it is being stretched and tested in ways that we haven't seen at least in, in at least a generation. Um, but I also think this moment holds an enormous amount of promise. I think we are at a crossroads in our democracy, and this is an opportunity for us to advance it and transform it and do something and make it what it has never been or to potentially lose it. And that is, for me and the work that I do at the Legal Defense Fund, along with the amazing staff we have, that's our job to make sure that we actually fulfill the promise of this democracy and not... Um, and not concede to the peril that is that it that it's facing, but it's not an easy it's not an easy question, and the outcome is certainly not a foregone conclusion. Hassan, I will I second it. I second the motion on the floor. Excellent. <laughs> um, You're getting practice, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I would add, and and I'm sure we'll get into get into this a little further, that the principal threat that this democracy is facing right now, and specifically what we're talking about is a multiracial democracy, which is, hasn't lived that long in the United States, that the principal threat is an old one, and that is white supremacy. That when we saw what happened on January 6th, these were people who were mobilized around the idea of maintaining a white supremacist nation, and the principal threat to a multiracial democracy is in fact white supremacy. The white supremacists understand that. The rest of us, I'm not quite so sure. Well, I want to thank my colleague Anna Bross for introducing us and for introducing the podcast that I've been working on uh, for the past year and some change. 
Uh, we thought it was a good opportunity to link a couple discussions. So this is, we're looking at the future of the civil rights movement. For the past seven years at the Atlantic, I've been covering voting rights, civil rights, and a lot of that's been about uh, the past of civil rights. And I think I'm gonna share a clip from uh, the show, and this is the first time anybody in the world outside the team is gonna hear it, so I'm excited for it. Um, and I think it'll help frame the conversation uh, because we're looking at a moment that many people say the civil rights movement ended. Tequina's family didn't live too far from the 8th Street corridor where Vanessa Dixon and her brother Vincent were born and where they started their first hustles raking leaves and carrying groceries. Oh my God, it was wonderful. You know, I wish I could have raised my kids or my grandkids that could have been raised in a neighborhood like I was in. Everybody knew everybody's name. Everybody knew everybody's business. So, Hassan, we've worked together before on a documentary called Lowndes County and the Road to Black Power. Uh, and your work on the history of the struggle and especially on Bloody Lounge and the movement to get people in that county uh, not just involved in democracy but shaping it obviously was important to us. Uh, and I want to know, what brought you to that story? What brings you to this story of civil rights in America? Uh, well, specifically, my interest in what happened in Lowndes County, Alabama, which is uh, a small majority black county uh, in the heart of Alabama, located between Montgomery to the, to the west and uh, or, or Sel Montgomery to the east and Selma to the west, um, is what happened there. This is a county that was 80% African American. At the start of 1965, had zero registered black voters. And by the end of the next year, not only had succeeded with a partnership between local people and student nonviolent coordinating com committee activists, not only had succeeded in registering a majority of African Americans, but created their own independent political party, small d, democratic, radical party that was the original Black Panther Party. And so my interest in this was how, not just what happened, but how did it happen? So the opening question was about the perils of democracy. So here we had ordinary folk, rural folk, not the, not the coastal elites, not the radical intellectuals that we like to think about, but people who were on the ground who had a clear vision of what democracy ought to look like and engaged in a process of building it from the ground up. And so my interest in the story, my interest in the movement, my interest in civil rights history uh, was about how these people against these obstacles during this time were able to create something that was fundamentally un-American if you understand the traditional way in which American politics have been played out. Janae, I want to ask the same question to you. Uh, we've talked a, a few times over the years, uh, not just in your current capacity, but you've been a key contributor to uh, the research, to the in intellectual world of voting rights. And I want to know what brings you to that world, and uh, why make that choice? So this is a perfect question to ask a week almost to the day that I was in Selma, Alabama, celebrating the 58th Jubilee of Bloody Sunday, the commemoration of the moment that spurred us into, in fact, becoming a democracy for the first time in this country's history. I don't think anyone could say with any real uh, justification that prior to 1965, we were truly a full-fledged democracy because there were large swaths of our population who did not have full enfranchisement, could not fully exercise the right to vote. And even post-1965, we were still struggling with it, but at least we were able to have the right legal apparatus to ensure it. So in Selma, I was there with foot soldiers, uh, people who were 16 and 17 years old as they crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge named after a Ku Klux Klan leader uh, and were beaten bloody to give us all an opportunity to participate as equal citizens in our democracy and in the right to vote. It's those people and their willingness to put their lives on the line that gives me inspiration and strength and has brought me to this story, especially as someone who did not always appreciate the right to vote. I didn't always think it was the powerful tool that it is, but it has proven to be so transformative and so um, has such potential 
that it is constantly under threat. That is an indication of how much power uh, and currency the right to vote holds, because it is constantly and incessantly under attack. Now, I want to bounce that back to you, because what is it, 58 years last week? 58 years since Bloody Sunday, right? Yep. And you work at an organization that has, obviously, both feet in the history of this, and you've run across and encountered and worked under and with people who've seen so much of the history. I'm curious, what now that uh, you lead the organization, um, I don't know, I, I wanna know what's it like in your shoes a bit, but also, <laughs> do you feel a connection to that history now? Oh, absolutely, each and every day. Uh, I work in an office in New York that has Thurgood Marshall's desk in it. <laughs> I feel connection. the weight yeah. of that history every moment uh, of, of the day. And that history is very much with us. The history is not past. We are still living it. If I think about what actually incited the protests on Bloody Sunday, it was the killing of Jimmy Lee Jackson, who was protesting because his mother was denied the right to vote. He was killed by a police officer. And that helped to spur the protest that we saw that led to Bloody Sunday, ultimately the Selma to Montgomery march that the Legal Defense Fund helped to litigate to get the order in the court that allowed the march to take place after the, the horrible attack on, on protesters. And we have cases today where we are defending protesters in Louisville and Philly and other places and defending the right to vote. So sadly, the work that historically grounds us is still very much present today. Hassan, this conversation, obviously, we're talking about civil rights, but I think we would be remiss to not also talk about the uses and considerations of history. Uh, and in this moment when people are talking about critical race theory, what they call critical race theory in schools, and how we teach this history, what to you is the role of history, of black history, in considering our present moment? And I guess uh, how much should we consider it? Well, I think history in general serves uh, an important role uh, in how we move through society, how we understand society. I see, I, you know, there's, there's useful history and there's useless history. Uh, the useful history, uh, African American history, black history, certainly falls within the category of useful history. It's useful in the sense that it helps us not only understand the experiences of black people in the past and in the present, but it helps us better understand the American journey, right? And you have to understand America's past, talking specifically about America in this context and American history, you gotta understand the American past in order, under, in order to understand the American present, period. You can't make sense of today unless you make sense of yesterday. And the importance of that is critical, you know, speaking as an educator, because our role, and as a history educator, is not just simply to help students understand the past and make sense of the present, but we're handing it off to them. And understanding the present gives students the tools that they need to solve the problems in the future that we haven't been able to solve today and the ones that we're actually creating today. And so this isn't just simply an academic question of whether or not you see the educational value of something like black studies. This is about how we make sense of the society in which we live and how we create a better society going forward. And I think it's that which actually has so many people afraid and scared and pushing back on the political right. Because I'll tell you this, you know, I teach at Ohio State. It's a very white school, a lot of white kids at Ohio State. And when they come through our classes, when they come through my classes and we're talking about the civil rights movement, we're talking about African American history, we're talking truthfully about the American past, the good and the bad and the ugly and everything. There's some, you know, you know there's some denial, there's some anxiety, there's some depression. But in the end, they get it, they understand it. But they don't just accept the history. Once they see and understand how America sort of evolved over time, they wanna then do something about it. Action, they wanna take action. That's what we saw in the summer of 2020. That just wasn't a whole bunch of black kids out there, right? And those are young folk, those are young white folk, and Latinos and Asians. They were, wanted to take action. And it's that action among young people, connect, because they're seeing the power of the past to help them make sense of everything that's going on that has so many shook. 
Now we're talking about you know, this time, like we just said, 58 years, between five and six decades when we're, we're thinking about the freedom struggle in America. The thing I keep coming back to in my own work, especially as I'm interviewing people who were primary participants in that movement, is how it's not a long time at all. It is a, a few generations space. It, there are people, my great grandmother was a grandmother and I knew her and she was a grandmother before she was able to vote in Mississippi. I think about that a lot and it's been something that's on my mind when we've been making the show. Um, and I'm gonna bring another clip from that show uh, to y'all. It's about the March on Washington in 63. And we've talked to people who were there and they were thinking about what it meant to have a movement for democracy hosted in a city that then, again, in the, in the span of lots of people's lifetimes, could not vote uh, for its own politicians. The apparent freedom and prosperity they had had limits. Brother John Lewis. At the march, civil rights hero John Lewis went to the podium and started talking about voter disenfranchisement. One man, one vote, it is an elephant and crime. It is our tool. It must be ours. One man, one vote. He was talking about the Deep South, but he was also speaking in a majority black city that didn't even elect its own leaders and had no representation in Congress. D.C. was controlled by a committee in the House that was full of segregationists. Washingtonians had just barely gotten the right to vote for president. For Rowland and some others like him, the contradiction was glaring. How could D.C. be the black metropolis if black people couldn't even govern themselves? You know, when you think about things like the March on Washington and the, the role that that played with all the people descending upon the district. And I think one of the issues for the district was not being able to vote. And so that's a home rule was a big issue. And so I think that fermented some of the discontent. Now I want to turn us to the present for a bit because this is still an issue. And I know uh, LDF has had uh, uh, real positions on this. And I'm going to ask you, Janae, thinking about DC, about uh, the potential for statehood, about all these other uh, sort of uh, considerations about expanding the franchise and what we think democracy is. Uh, do you think there's opportunities for uh, expanding it in that direction? Yeah, so again, the past is not past. It's very much with us. If we know anything about what's happening in D.C. right now, we know that 83% of D.C. voters decided to update and change its criminal code to make it more representative of current thinking about criminology, current thinking about uh, restorative justice, they have the right to determine what makes sense for their own public safety concerns. And they updated their criminal code only to have Congress override the will of the majority of people in DC. They are treated like second class citizens. It is a substantially black city, used to be majority, no longer is. And part of that is because the city itself has become so gentrified, has become so inaccessible for black people that the population is changing and it's reflecting that and that's because they don't have the they don't have adequate political representation and agency to this day in 2023 so John Lewis who was the the grandfather of the Bloody Sunday March and the Voting Rights Act movement uh, is saying what 58 55 years ago the same thing that people are saying now, and that is give DC residents an equal say in their own destiny and their own agency through the right to vote. Uh, so it's very, it's, it's, it's telling that we are still fighting these same battles, but that is an opportunity to expand the electorate and to make our democracy more representative and more fair. And there are other ways in which we can do that as well. There are so many opportunities and they lie in restoring the Voting Rights Act to its full capacity through the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. It lies in the Freedom to Vote Act, which would make voting easier for everyone in this country. There's still a lot more democracy work for all of us to do. And there was an executive order, right? Uh, what, two years ago now? Uh, what is your assessment of how far we've gone with that EO and where we are now? 
Well, there are two. There's an executive order on advancing equity that reversed a horrific order uh, that really set in motion the attack on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and CRT, and everything that we're seeing today. And um, you know, LDF sued uh, then President Trump to uh, hold that executive order illegal. Uh, and unfortunately, we didn't have to complete the lawsuit. President Biden uh, reversed it on day one. But it wasn't enough just to reverse it. It was important that he replace it with a, a, a mandate to advance racial equity and a mandate to expand voting. And those executive orders exist. They are important to read and look at, but we want action, I mean, to your point, right? We need them to be fully effectuated and to expand opportunities to register people to vote, uh, which the voting order does in federal agencies. We need this to actually happen, and we need it to happen before 2024. Hassan, thinking back about that clip that we played, one thing that struck me while we were reporting this show out, when I was going and interviewing people about, say, home rule in DC, about uh, the role of segregation in controlling its policy, is that was something that so many people, so many old timers in the city knew just sort of firsthand and had a very strong sense of, but it's not something that seems to make its way into our current understanding of why, say, statehood for DC is an issue of race, is an issue tied to race. Do you think, uh, and I've gone back and forth with our copy and promo teams about this, but do you think that's because we are forgetting or because we have suppressed the history? I think that we as Americans suffer from purposeful historical amnesia. There are aspects and elements of our past that we purposefully choose to ignore. And, and so, so part of it is intentional suppression, but we do more than that. I mean, we, we saw this in you know, the 100th uh, anniversary, if you will, of the, the, the Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, racial massacre, when people were like, oh my goodness, that happened? Like, yeah, it was in the newspaper, right? So, so what, how do we, how do we not, how is this not in the public consciousness? And so there is this element of purpose, purposeful historical um, amnesia, suppressing the past, but only those aspects of the past that don't fit neatly into a narrative that serves a particular political purpose. And so sometimes this is done on the political right, sometimes this is done on the political left. Joe Biden, on the anniversary of the January 6th, of the one, marking the one year now, one year after the uh, insurrection on January 6th, gave a powerful speech, and I'm sure you, you all may recall, where he called out domestic terrorism. And, I, and I'm watching, I'm like, all right, you're like, yeah, Joe, we've been waiting for you, right? Like, cool. And he's going along, he's going along. And then at the 18 minute mark, I had to rewind, at the 18 minute mark, he says, in speaking about political violence, he says, this is not who we are. This has never been who we are. And I was like, what the? I was like, wait, Joe. Like, what are you talking about? What is this revisionist version of the past? This is exactly who we are. This is how we were birthed the American Revolution. This is how we almost dissolved the Civil War. We have been relying upon political violence as a means to turn America in particular directions. Abraham Lincoln didn't die of natural causes. Martin Luther King didn't die of natural causes. Mega Evers didn't die of natural causes. John F. Kennedy didn't die of natural causes. So sometimes we, suppress, if you will, the past to suit a particular narrative, but we gotta lean into it. Because if we pretend as though that isn't a part of our DNA, then we'll never be able to adequately deal with the implications and ramifications of it when it surfaces. Now, I wanna ask both of you, I'm glad you mentioned January 6th because it's the obvious context for all these conversations we've been having all day about the future of democracy. Uh, I wanna ask you, in your estimation, was that insurrection tied to this history of race and the franchise in America? Start with Janae. Absolutely, I mean, unequivocally, yes. Uh, every time there has been progress and advancement on issues of racial justice, and we saw that in 2020, as you mentioned, when you saw a multiracial, socioeconomically intergenerational uh, movement happen in 2020 in reaction to black anti-black racism and violence, right? The largest 
response and uprising that this country had ever seen, larger than the civil rights mm -hmm. movement, and one that then went global, and one that connected to democracy fights across the, the, the globe. When we saw that threat emerge, we then saw a backlash that we are all experiencing in this moment. And it's always been my view that the, the force of the backlash, the intensity of it, is directly commensurate with the potential that it is trying to thwart. It's directly commensurate with what they see as the vastness of the threat of the people taking to the streets, demanding a better democracy, demanding a reckoning and a confrontation with history, and demanding transformation at the end of the day as a, as a result. So we saw this in Reconstruction. And then there was the period of redemption. We saw the civil rights movement and then immediately a backlash against all of the powerful civil rights legislation that helped transform this country into uh, the place that we generally take for granted so many of the rights that we enjoy today. So there's that cycle that is very much part of our DNA, our history. It's so predictable that we should be able to prepare for it and come out ahead of it. But instead, this willful blindness allows us to have this magical thinking that we somehow have overcome, that we are beyond um, this, this violence and this threat. And therefore, we are not really equipped when white supremacy surfaces in this bold and blatant way. It's always been with us. But when it resurfaces uh, this, this, this baldly, somehow we are aghast and we, and we say, this is not us. It very much is who we are and we have to reckon with that, prepare for it and, and stare it in the face once and for all if we hope to ever get beyond some of the threats that continue to plague mm -hmm. our democracy. I wanna pose the same question to you, Hassan. Uh, I mean, I, unless you have nothing else to add. I always got something <laughs> to say, man. So what we saw, I think on January 6th, well, certainly, we all should have been shocked by it. We had never seen citizens of this country attempt to stop the peaceful transfer of power between presidencies. We had never seen that before. Shocking, everyone should have been shocked. But we should not have been surprised because when we look at history, not only do we see a history of political violence, but we see a history of political violence tied and animated by racism. Racism is the most powerful political organizing tool that America has ever created. And we have seen it once again deployed effectively over the last four to six years. And, but this isn't also anything, as you mentioned, this isn't anything new. People talk about sort of history repeating itself. Like, no, when have we stopped doing the things that have created the inequality in the past and in the present? So this is just heightened, this is just you know, animated, animating people in different ways. We had in an earlier session, the Secretary of, uh, Secretary of State for Georgia, who proudly declared himself to be a Reagan Democrat, which was cool, which was great. Ronald Reagan also launched his political campaign for presidency in 1980 in Mississippi, in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Why? Because this was the place where three civil rights workers had been murdered in 1964. He was playing to this idea of galvanizing and animating people around racism. So this isn't new, and it's also very effective, and it can have very serious and deadly consequences. Speaking of being, I guess, shocked but not surprised, one of the things that uh, just I keep coming back to, we reported out with the podcast, was in 68, the year King was killed, uh, you saw this robust white backlash that was forming so quickly. You saw uh, there were polls taken of people in May of 1968, and the majority of white Americans then did not believe that boycotts, that protests, that marches, that anything but protest meetings in closed spaces were okay for black Americans to pursue. And they said that mostly the whole uh, ball game had already been given. and. I keep coming back to it because I think it speaks to what you all are, uh, are, are saying. I'm curious though, uh, with this historical uh, this cycle of movement, of backlash that seems to keep happening, have you all seen anything that sort of feels like it might break that cycle, that, that might move the ball actually forward? 
Yeah, I, I, I'm very encouraged by um, this sense of uh, both entitlement and intolerance that many young people have. And sometimes we think of those as negatives and we think that that's problematic. But I love that people who have grown up with an expectation that their humanity will be recognized and that they deserve dignity will not really settle for much less. I mean, I just came from a panel earlier that was Gen Z women disrupting politics. And there were some powerful women of color, young women who were just speaking so brilliantly and so incisively about the needs of the current generation and their fearlessness in stepping into power. And I don't wanna say this to suggest that the rest of us don't have work to do and that we did not help create the problem that we so often want to suggest the next generation solves, but it does give me a lot of hope that there is a new generation of, of activists, of voters, of leaders who just will not take anything less than what they deserve. They are not in the transitional moment that some of us were in where we're sort of bridging the civil rights gains and occupying a space that historically was never offered and open to us. These folks were born into that and, and, they, and they are not going to settle for anything less and it's up to us to ensure that they are fully empowered to live out their vision of a collective future where dignity is sacred and power is shared and thriving is the standard. And that is the mission of the Legal Defense Fund, what I just shared now. And that is what I'm hoping to see as we go forward and, and does give me hope about the potential of this moment. Well, democracy movements have often been youth movements, right? Hassan, you, you, you looked at Bloody Lounge when SNCC was there and I'm always just amazed by the fact that the veterans on the ground were what, 25 years old? <laughs> Why is it that young people had this energy and seem to always be at the cutting edge? So young people have certainly played this critical role, bringing in, breathing in new energy, um, a new vision, new excitement, but they've also always worked in partnership. The most successful ones have worked in partnership with elders, with an older generation. So there's always been this sort of intergenerational sort of relationship. Now, usually it's the older generation getting in the way of the younger generation, so we gotta understand and appreciate that, but there's a wisdom that needs to be imparted, imparted to, the, to, the, to, to a younger activists. And so I think the most successful ones, I mean, we see that with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I mean, their principal advisor is, is Ella Baker, right? I mean, who's a veteran civil rights activist of some 30 years at the time. So we focus on the young, but we don't necessarily recognize the old. Uh, but to tie that back to the, the, the question that you had just asked about sort of the, the, the hope, the vision of, of do I see anything now? And I think it goes absolutely back to what we saw in 2020. Because not only did we just, just experience the largest protest in American history by far, 250,000 people showed up for the March on Washington. We're talking about 20 or 30 million people each month during that summer. But they weren't just calling for justice for the victims of police violence. They weren't just calling for a recognition of black humanity, which is critical. They weren't just calling for uh, honesty and education, take down the statues, but they were also calling for an end to systemic racism. So that was a fundamental game changer, right? And, and not by black folk, right? Charles Hamilton Houston, legal defense fund. He's like, look, we gotta be social engineers. We gotta change this whole damn thing from the bottom up. We black folk been calling for an end to systemic racism, institutional racism, however you call it, for generations. But when you get little white girls and little white boys from the suburbs going back home, talking about, ma, we got to do something about this, this systemic racism thing, that's a fundamentally different way of seeing the world and then wanting to do something about it. And so is there, uh, and, and that also garnered that backlash, right? Because it wasn't just like, ah, oh, these are some black kids who are protesting. People are now saying, you got to change everything and we might even need to start over. There are people who benefit from the status quo who benefit from not having things change, and that's what we're up against now. Well, you did see those 20, 30 million people. You saw a uh, real big initiative. You saw lots of uh, sort of promises from the White House and the Hill. Uh, but looking at the last few months, you've seen um, the ranks of DEI officers 
have thinned and they tend to thin uh, most when it involves people of color. Uh, you've seen a lot of those promises of, around policing, around uh, reforming or uh, getting rid of police departments in certain places. They've mostly been abandoned. Uh, do you think that energy has dissipated or, or, or can people find it again? I think we can tap into it. I mean, what's really interesting is, you know, Hassan said that racism is the greatest organizing tool in this country and attendant to that is this fear around crime and criminality. And what's, what's deeply, deeply frustrating is that, and we're a nonpartisan organization, so for us it's, it's neither right nor left, it's the fact that our elected officials generally all seem to subscribe to this fear of crime, this association with black criminality, um, this fiction, and then s quickly back away from common sense reforms around public safety, from, from, from smart ideas, data-driven, data-based solutions to public safety, and instead say, let's add 100,000 more police to the forces across the country. Let's, let's fund more military equipment in under-resourced communities when we know that bringing education, economic opportunity, and agency to communities that are experiencing crime and harm are the proven solutions to ending it permanently, not just a Band-Aid, not just you know, occupying a community and arresting people and then creating a cycle of incarceration that has generational effects. We're talking about actually uprooting the issues that create crime. And everyone wants to look the other way when you raise, you know, an issue around that that word of crime and safety. So we've we've got to hold all of our elected officials accountable. We have to allow them to stop using the tropes of of black criminality and fear of the other and it ex expands to people who are emigrating to this country as well. We've got to stop that and hold them accountable to real solutions around this issue because that is where we see you know, the drifting from um, you know, what, what was and I still think has the potential to be a key transformative moment in our history. I want to know, thinking really into the future, uh, well, let's, let's go short range first. What, how is the LDF strategizing for these next few elections? What do you think are the biggest threats on the horizon? So every election, we have a increasingly large election protection apparatus where we are just focused on making sure people are able to cast a ballot that is counted. And what has come out of that is that we are working year round, sending letters to make sure that people's uh, that they are aware of their polling location, that if a polling location changes and we feel that it was motivated by race or motivated by uh, an effort to disfranchise a particular community, that we are advocating early to make sure that that information is uh, widespread and that we actually are creating many access points, whether it be the siting of a polling location, secure drop boxes, mail-in voting. We're trying to make voting more accessible to any and everyone because we don't fear the majority, right? We don't fear the electorate. We want all voices to be heard and to help influence our representative democracy. So that's the work that we do on a daily basis. We're also in the Supreme Court fighting uh, a partisan and racial gerrymandering um, districts in the South. Our case, Merrill versus Milligan, is challenging congressional redistricting in Alabama, but we also have proven in the state of Louisiana, in South Carolina, that those congressional districts are based on racial discrimination. And that's really important because it's a national issue. Congress, which you may know a little bit of something about, right, has, <laughs> has, um, <laughs> has, has such significance for just determining the you know, our daily lives and, and, and our, ri our rights and our freedoms. And if any one state is gerrymandered, the representation in that body that governs us nationally is distorted. And it itself lacks legitimacy. So these issues are not relegated just to the South. They're not just, you know, isolated in black communities. Everyone's political representation is manipulated uh, and harmed 
when we see this type of discrimination infect our electoral process. Uh, Hassan, what do you think about uh, the leadership, particularly congressional leadership, <laughs> and how it's moving forward with things like the John, John Lewis voting rights bill um, and expanding the franchise? What's your assessment? What's your, how would you grade them? <laughs> how would I grade them? Yeah. Am I going to say that publicly? <laughs> The We're amongst we mostly from his family. I know, I know, I know. No, look, you know, when we think about Congress um, and uh, House leadership right now, uh, we just had Speaker Pelosi, Speaker Emerita Pelosi, who was here, who was here earlier, which is cool. Um, and the, and the, the current uh, minority leader, I mean, he, I, right. the. <laughs> well, we got to understand, you know, sort of real limits in terms of what you can do, right? Would depend upon who's in power, and it's, it's you know, checks and balances, and so I get that. Um, would I like to see? You said it just a second ago. Like, this isn't about partisan politics. This isn't about partisanship, right? Democracy should never be about partisanship, right? You should, we should do everything in our power, regardless of your political affiliation, to make it easier for people to participate in the political process and not more difficult. And right now, we're dealing with very real efforts to suppress the vote. We're past the, we're past the point where the principal challenge to democracy is voter exclusion on the whole scale. That was Jim Crow. This is no longer about voter exclusion. This is about voter limitation. This is about voter suppressing, because you don't need to take out a majority of a population, or the entire population, if you just pick off and make it more difficult for sub certain sections of that population, then you can swing entire elections. You can swing national elections. And again, this shouldn't be about right or left. It turns out it is, but we have to be clear about democracy should incorporate and include everybody. And it's also important to note that the ways in which you're talking about African American history, how do you think we've expanded our democracy? It's been black folk who have been at the front line of expanding democracy. The, the, you know, I, I probably came here too early because I was listening. I got the Secretary of State of Georgia in my mind, and he was touting, he was touting um, uh, motor voter. He was touting voter registration at, at DMVs, and he was like, this is, making, this is making Georgia more democratic. Well, how do you think, one, that actually came about, right? I mean, that's civil rights activists who pushed that. And then two, let's not forget what you're supporting right now in Georgia, making it more difficult for people to vote. And so I think you know, we have to be clear that when it comes to uh, our ballots, one person, one vote, that we should all do what we can to make it easier, to make it more accessible and not more difficult for people to participate. Now we've talked about how over the past few generations things have changed and not changed uh, in the front of civil rights and democracy. I'm wondering, looking forward, if you can, a generation or two, what do you think are the biggest threats or challenges on that long time horizon? One, I think a lot of it has to do with the vote, to be sure. Who has access to it? Who values it? How do people see themselves participating in the political process? A lot of the voter a lot of the vo election laws, voter registration laws right now, are designed to uh, purportedly protect the vote uh, from, from voter fraud. Like, America does not have a voter impersonation problem. Americans don't vote, right? I mean, you look at the numbers, just Americans don't vote. They ain't voting two and three times, they ain't voting at all, right? And so one of the things that I think, one of the dangers on the horizon, to be sure, um, is participation in the political process. The harder we make it to participate, the more and more people will choose not to. And that's a very dangerous thing, uh, because then you wind up uh, with people in office uh, who are more interested in being in office than they are in serving the people who put them there. And so I definitely think that on the horizon, we have to worry about uh, people losing faith in participating in a democracy. Now, that doesn't mean that the vote is going to save everything and solve everything. It's not. We have serious economic issues. We have serious social and cultural issues. But that is one area, and they're all connected and all interrelated. But that's one area that we know we can strengthen. And it's not complicated, and we know how to do it. We're just choosing not to. 
And if we don't, it will exacerbate the problems that exist in all of these other areas as well. I'm gonna pass it to, to you, Janae. Yeah, well, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and, you know, Hassan talked about voter suppression and now it, you know, it going from excluding people from the electorate to suppressing the vote. And what I wanna add to that, just to tie it back to January 6th, is we now have the threat of election sabotage, right? So even when people turn out, even when the votes are cast, there's a contest about how they will be counted and whether the outcome will be actually effectuated and whether we might experience political violence again. So the threats are metastasizing. They are becoming you know, much scarier in many ways because as you said, even though it wasn't surprising that um, white supremacy would, would rear up and do anything within its, its power and reach to try to entrench this minoritarian rule, which is what we're experiencing with this demographic transition in this country, it's not surprising, but it is getting more and more, we are moving further away from the direction in which we were evolving, which is where you know political violence should be something that, that is absolutely beyond the pale for all of us, right? Um, and that's why we're seeing the ruthless partisan gerrymandering happening. That's why we're seeing just um, the, the attack on truth. We are now fighting with gloves completely off. People are straight up lying, right? <laughs> straight up lying, suppressing information, uh, banning books, keeping us from even understanding the context of our current circumstance. That's a very, very dangerous place to be. And you know, I, I've talked a lot about the trifecta of assaults that we are experiencing, the assault on protest, the assault on the right to vote, and the assault on truth. And those three combined will create a generation that is utterly powerless, right? If they can't protest, if, if they can't exercise their will through the right to vote, and if they don't have information, the other two attacks will go away because you won't even have a population who will have enough information to know and understand their own subjugation. So it's a, it's a serious threat that we're facing and experiencing, but I do think that, as I said, there, there's a generation of folks who, who understand this complexity and are ready to confront it. So I, um, you know, I, I, I do hold a lot of hope, but I think we have to not shy away from naming the threats that we're facing and, and not be um, cowed by, you know, the significance and size of the threat. I think we are, we are up for the challenge, but we've got to face it head on. Now I want to stress test that for a little bit because we are coming off an election, an election year where several uh, gerrymanders were overturned in court, where despite uh, lots of uh, people predicting that uh, gerrymandering and uh, voter suppression would contribute to a red wave, you saw Democrats do pretty well in the last election cycle. And I've seen lots of commentary basically saying that kind of proves that this uh, panic over voter suppression was a bit overblown. How, do you, uh, how does that factor into your analysis? Yeah, well, I will answer it in the context of, of black voter participation and, and, and not so much the partisan politics of it all. We often hear that argument you know, in court papers. Uh, well, black voters were still able to turn out, which means that there is no voter suppression. The fact that we have to work twice as hard to cast a ballot, the fact that it takes an investment of resources from nonprofit organizations like the Legal Defense Fund and our colleagues in the field, the millions of dollars that we pour into keeping our elections safe and fair should not happen in a modern democracy. This is really the responsibility of the state to make sure all of its citizens can cast a ballot that will be counted. Instead, you have non-governmental organizations raising money from all of you, and, and thank you for your contributions, and it's then going to try to protect our elections, which really our taxpayer dollars should already be doing. Our elected officials who have been you know, voted into office should be held accountable to do that, and they should be passing the legislation to make it possible so that we aren't having to bring multi-million dollar lawsuits to vindicate the right to vote in elections that have already passed that we can't undo, we can't unring that bell. The people who are elected based on these racist, gerrymandered redistricting maps 
will still be in office even when we win our lawsuit. It will not undo that fact. So the harm is there. And if we want to get out ahead of that, if we really want to right this ship, we have to bring the Voting Rights Act back and bring back the preclearance process, which uh, filters any new voting laws through a federal process to make sure that they won't affect racial discrimination. We need to have these checks and balances in our system because they, they have worked, one, in the past, and they're a recognition that we are not a democracy that can ride without any guardrails. We just aren't. And we need to accept that about um, ourselves and our history and know what our limitations are and erect the right structures to ensure that we can evolve into the rich, multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy that, that we all deserve to enjoy. If, if I could add, I mean, if you look at districts that were wiped off the map, in Florida, Alabama, South Carolina, three majority black districts that just disappeared. And then the unfair congressional districts that exist because of maps, unfair maps that exist in Ohio and in Wisconsin, that right there changes who controls the House of Representatives right now. I mean, that's just 2020. And so in addition to the fact that the reason why you have black turnout is because of these organizations that are working so hard and shouldn't. We are feeling the effects of gerrymandering. We are feeling the effects of purposefully, of efforts to intentionally make unfair districts today. Now, I think we focused rightly on challenges ahead, but one thing I, I, I would love to ask both of you, given uh, your both being steeped in this history of movement is are there pieces of that history or examples or leaders uh, who in, maybe inspire you that uh, changing and expanding the franchise, democracy, and access to civil rights uh, is possible in the future? Well, one of the most important lessons I think that we can take away from the modern civil rights movement uh, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, early 1970s um, actually is something that we don't think of. When I talk to my students, they say, how many people showed up to the March on Washington? They're like, millions. I'm like, no, 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 250,000 people. And because they think everybody supported the movement, right? They, they, they ignore the opposition. Talk about, you know, you know, King didn't die of natural causes, right? You got a whole podcast on this. What, what's the consequences of it? But the truth is, it wasn't a lot of people. But that also means that it doesn't take a lot of people to make a big difference. And so we can apply that today. It doesn't take a lot of people. It's not a lot of people who are showing up at these school board elections ranting and raving and trying to pull books. It's not a lot of people. And so the same forces that are small, that are pushing an anti-democratic United States, it won't take a lot of people, committed people, working with committed organizations to move the needle in the other direction. Yeah, that's 100% that's, that's correct. Um, and, but the one thing that really does give me a lot of solace is that we who believe in freedom and equality are actually in the majority, right? So there actually are a lot of people. They may not all be taken to the streets. They may not all have the wherewithal to engage in protest and, and do the things that we do and write and, and do this sort of advocacy um, that, that advances the ball so directly. But there are so many people in support of what we believe in, and we should not lose sight of that. There's a very vociferous minority that, as you say, are, are, are you know, creating viral videos at school board meetings, but most of us actually want our children to read and read a variety of books and understand how to critically analyze issues, and that, that is important for us to tap into that groundswell of support, even if people aren't in the moment pouring out in the streets. And, you know, when I think about inspiration and people who um, have really helped me appreciate the importance of democracy and the right to vote within it, I mean, I do think of our founder, Thurgood Marshall, who, when asked what his most important case was, did not say Brown versus Board of Education, which he easily could have said, and you know, many people may say he should have said because that ended legal apartheid in this country. He instead pointed to a case called Smith versus Allwright out of Texas here, which abolished all white primaries in the Democratic Party here in Texas. Uh, and he said that was his most significant case. 
That was a democracy case. That was, that was a, a voting case. And it, it harkens back to something that the Supreme Court said in 1886 when it said that the right to vote is preservative of all rights. So it's true that the right to vote isn't a panacea, but it undergirds our ability to protect every other right that we enjoy. So when I think about that, and I think about the people who laid their lives on the line for the right to vote, there's been more blood shed over the right to vote than any other right in our history. And that tells you how much power it holds and how it is now our leg of the race to advance it. Wow. <laughs> I hope this is not uh, gratuitous, but I do want to play one more clip from the show that I think actually speaks to a lot of what uh, we have been talking about. And it is, uh, we went to the streets on, uh, and let's go to the last one, the very last clip. We went to the, the streets, talked to people who were there after King was assassinated, and just got a sense of what it was like to be there. Widespread violence and looting broke out in two areas of New York City tonight in the wake of the slaying of Dr. Martin Luther King in Memphis. 6,000 guardsmen had been alerted during the afternoon as the vandalism and looting reached alarming proportions. This morning, the first violent acts were reported as small gangs of youths roamed the still riot-scarred sections of Detroit, throwing bricks, bottles, and rocks through At least 4,000 National Guard and federal troops are in this uneasy town tonight. And more stand ready. I immediately hit the street, man. I didn't know what was going to happen. After King was assassinated, black neighborhoods erupted for days. New York, Memphis, D.C., Chicago, Baltimore. In all, over 100 places went up. They were called riots or rebellions, sometimes now uprisings. Whatever you call them, and for whatever political reasons, the week was one of the most consequential in American history. Hundreds of Negroes were lining the streets, apparently in reaction to the news of Dr. King. People that lived in the neighborhood were coming outside, throwing a rock, throwing a bomb. It was scary. Mothers and fathers were coming out. Older men, older women. I couldn't get in touch with my parents. I couldn't get in touch with my aunt. I noticed some windows breaking, and I looked, and the Negroes had started looting stores in the area, mainly pawn shops and clothing stores. We all were just like, this is a release. It felt like the world was in chaos. They then spotted me, and a very big, burly Negro said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm just leaving. And they said, well, you better run. A white man killed a prominent person in our life. That prominent person had taken on an almost prophetic role. It's easy to see why his death became a sort of religious event. Dr. King was a Baptist preacher. His philosophy of nonviolence taught that his own suffering could be redemptive. More and more people viewed him as a sort of messiah. He even died during the Easter season. Across the country, the temptation to make King a martyr for white America's sins was irresistible. But in America's ghettos, that sin had not been washed away. As a child, it, it, you knew you, you took the loss, but it didn't hit you in the pit of your heart as it does today when I sit back and think about the all that he went through for us. I hope that all Americans tonight will search their hearts as they ponder this most tragic incident. By nightfall, there was a soldier on every corner. At least 100 fires have been ignited. Several are burning out of control at this hour. In your neighborhood. Yeah, in your neighborhood where you're trying to make beauty. You're trying to make art. Hey, how you doing? This is James Lewis. Good. All right. All right. This is like aliens have just landed in the neighborhood. It's believed by the Memphis Police Department that a, an emergency situation does exist. And at this time, we are asking that all people of Memphis and Shelby County observe and as we put into effect our curfew 
we request that all persons, unless it's absolutely an emergency to be on the street, to go to their homes and stay there and, until uh, tomorrow when things hopefully will be in a better situation. That week, flags flew at half-mast. Crowds recited and played back King's speeches. They chanted his name. Choirs came together to sing songs honoring him, trying to keep people together. Millions of Americans mourned. But they didn't just mourn the man. They mourned a future that suddenly seemed impossible. I was a hospital employee, so I wound up having to report to work. It was, you know, kind of chaotic in the uh, hospital. I remember going to the top floor of the Washington Hospital then and looking out in one direction, seeing the, the smoke billowing from the, the buildings that had been set on fire. I see the military vehicles because D.C. was under martial law. And then the other direction, I could see the Capitol Dome with the flag flying. And, and I just kind of remember saying to myself, this is supposed to be the capital of the free world. You know, I was just thinking, what did our country come to? You know, I was just kind of feeling that, that uh, sense of loss and anxiety. The story we are often given transforms King's death from a tragedy into a sort of redemption, the final chapter of a victorious movement for justice. But that story is wrong. Oh my God, I hate hearing myself talk. <laughs> and it is much worse in front of a crowd of people. <laughs> Well, thank you all for sitting through it and listening to it, and I hope you all enjoy it, and go out and subscribe right now, if you can, to Holy Week. It's in your podcast players, and all episodes come out on March 14th. That's Tuesday. And uh, thank you so much, Hassan and Jameer, for being with us. Thank you all for being here.